Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, getting up this early after last night's party and coming out. I hope that you had fun last night, and I hope that we're going to have fun today as well. Um, so my name is Sasha Costanza Chuck. I use the pronouns she or they or ella or AJ in Spanish. Uh, I'm a white, non-binary, trans femme person uh, in my 40s with glasses and blonde hair. And I reside in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is lands that were stolen uh, from the Massachusetts and the Pawtucket people. And in the back there, I'm not seeing my slides on the monitor, if you could pull them up. Sure. So I acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the continued reality of forced occupation of these people's lands, the Massachusetts and the Pawtucket. And I commit to supporting the land back movement. And I do this because although the lands that we now know as the United States have been traversed by First Nations people for millennia, today these lands are fragmented by militarized borders. Regardless of which political party is in power in the, what we now know as the United States, the rollout of technical infrastructure for border hyper surveillance is continuing. And I'm showing an image of a blurred shadow silhouette against a backdrop of the Google home screen. So for example, investigative journalists at Tech Inquiry revealed a Google Cloud contract to work with Anduril Industries on a so-called virtual border wall. Why do the worst tech companies always use fantasy names, right? We've got Palantir, as we heard about yesterday in Monica's talk. We've got Anduril Industries. So they're creating a virtual border wall, which is a partnership to develop cutting edge sensing, AI risk assessment and detection systems and augmented reality user interface design in partnership with Customs and Border Patrol. And Customs and Border Patrol, or CBP, is the agency in the United States responsible for forced separation of thousands of children from their parents for extended periods of time. And that's not only under the Trump administration, it's under the current administration as well and myriad human rights abuses, including forced sterilizations and many deaths in custody. Now, nation states using advanced surveillance and automated decision systems, or ADS, which is more widely known by the marketing term artificial intelligence, or AI, to separate indigenous, black, and working poor children from their families is only the latest instance of hundreds of years of white supremacist settler colonial activity. The current wave of public debate over so-called existential risks, right, X risk, from AI, uh, the marketing term, is largely led by white cis men from the global minority, the Tesk realists, as we heard about yesterday from Monica, right? Um, and as we know, the mediated hype cycle around existential risk, so-called existential risk from AI, what it does is it amplifies fictional dystopian scenarios that are dreamed up by AI doomers. Instead of letting us engage in deep critical inquiry into the AI amplified harms that indigenous and diasporic and queer and trans people already experience on a daily basis. I'm showing an image of the cover of the book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need. The cover is black with blue and pink title letters, and it has a kaleidoscopic small blue hand-drawn flower uh, in the middle. So, we're living in disturbing times, right? When historical systems of oppression are being reinforced through socio-technical systems development across many domains of life. But this morning, I want to focus on the hopeful side, right? We've got enough, enough of, the, of the panic and doom. So I want to talk about a sea change that I feel and see and experience taking place. A sea change as many more people uh, some of them uh, designers and activists and developers and everyday people and folks such as yourself um, are becoming engaged in ideas and practice that can use design and use systems design in ways that are more liberating, ways that can help us build the worlds we need. 
I'm showing a picture of the table of contents of the book Design Justice. So the book is kind of an extensive reflection on the relationship between design and power and liberation and eco ecology and, and power inequalities, and it's organized into the chapters that you can see here. So the first chapter is called Design Values, and it's kind of about how do we encode uh, societal values into the systems that we build and create. And there's a chapter about practices, which is kind of about who gets to do design, um, and how do we, or how might we move towards more community control over design processes. The third chapter, Design Narratives, it's kind of asking this question, it's really what are the stories that we tell about design? You know, how do we scope and frame design challenges? Uh, what are the narratives that we tell about these processes and the products that come out the other side? Chapter four is about design sites, and that's a set of, you know, an extended meditation on the question around um, what are the locations that we privilege when we think about doing design work, doing design processes? Because design is happening all around us in all types of spaces and places, but um, some sites get seen as and privileged as sites of design, whereas others um, get relegated to the margins, get seen as that's only craft, or uh, get dismissed, or just don't get seen at all. And the last uh, chapter, substantive chapter, is about design pedagogies, which is about how do we teach and learn design justice or other ways of thinking about how we do design work. And the book is freely available from the MIT Press. It's open access. Uh, you can download it at the URL um, that's up there, which is design-justice.pubpub.org. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start with a brief excerpt from the book's introduction. Um, and then I'm hoping that we'll have time for a little bit of a conversation. So uh, let's start. Um, I want you to time travel with me a little bit. It's June of 2017, and I'm standing in the security line at the Detroit airport on my way back to Boston from the Allied Media Conference, or AMC, which is, quote, a collaborative laboratory of media-based organizing it's been held every year in Detroit for the past two decades. And at the Allied Media Conference, over 3,000 people gather each year to share ideas and strategies for how to create a more just, creative, and collaborative world. As a non-binary, trans, femme-presenting person, my time there is always deeply liberating. So I'm emerging from nearly a week immersed in this parallel universe that you can see some images uh, on the screen behind me. And so I'm tired, I'm really tired, but on a very deep level, I'm refreshed. And my reservoir of belief in the possibility of better futures has been replenished. But as I draw near the end of the security line, my stress levels begin to rise. And they begin to rise, and my heartbeat begins to speed up, because I know that I'm about to be subject to a very uncomfortable and humiliating search by a TSA officer after my body is flagged as anomalous by the millimeter wave scanner. I'm showing side-by-side -side images of the touchscreen interface for operators of an airport millimeter wave scanner. And on one side, you see a cartoon-like silhouette of a person with their chest area highlighted in fluorescent yellow. And on the other side, the silhouette has their genital areas highlighted. And the interface includes a blue boy button and a pink girl button. And the operator has to select one of these buttons before they scan for anomalies. And the image is from uh, Carrie Gabriel Costello's 2016 article, Traveling While Trans, The False Promise of Better Treatment. So I know that I'm about to be flagged as risky, as anomalous, because cis-normativity which is the assumption that all people have a gender identity and presentation that match the sex they were assigned at birth, has been built into the scanner. Cisnormativity is built in through the combination of user interface design, scanning technology, binary gendered body shape data constructs, and risk detection algorithms, as well as the socialization, the training, and the experience of the TSA agents. 
So an agent motions me, you know, step into the scanner. So I step forward, hands over my head in a triangle. And the scanner spins around my body, <laughs> makes that little sound. And then they motion me to step forward again. So I step forward onto the, the spot with the two little yellow uh, feet marks. And of course, I'm flagged. I'm flagged because the three-dimensional contours of my body at millimeter resolution differ from the statistical norm of female bodies as understood by a risk algorithm designed by the scanner and the manufacturer and its subcontractors and as trained by an army of workers tasked with labeling and classification as scholars like Mary Gray and Lily Irani have reminded us. Um, Mary Gray's fabulous book, uh, Ghost Work, with her co-author, I, I highly recommend that. So basically, if the agent selects male, if they press the blue boy button, then my chest area is different enough, statistically speaking, from a normative male data construct to be flagged as anomalous. And if they select female, uh, or the pink you know, girl button, then my uh, groin area it differs enough from the statistical data construct in the scanning uh, technology uh, to, be, to be flagged. And so I get yellow pixels highlighting one part of my body. In other words, I can't win. There's no way to win. The socio-technical system is hardwired to mark me as risky and that triggers an escalation to the next level in the security protocol. And on this particular day in June uh, in Detroit, this is what happens. I get flagged. So now the agent's going to ask me to you know, step aside uh, and ask for my consent to a physical body search. And typically at this point, now I'm close enough to them that they're getting confused about my gender. And so that presents another problem, because the next step in the security protocol is for either a male or female TSA agent to conduct a body search by running their hands across my arms, up inside my inner, inner arms, run them across my thighs, run them up my inner thighs, here, here, here. They call it a pat down, which is a very cute word for a fairly invasive and humiliating procedure. And according to TSA policy, quote, if a pat down is performed, it will be conducted by an officer of the same gender as you present yourself. They don't usually have a non-binary trans femme officer just hanging out waiting for me <laughs> to come to the airport. So um, on this particular day, uh, it becomes a thing. There's one confused officer who calls over another officer and they're debating over who should search me and they're supposed to ask me, but uh, finally one of them comes to search me and at this point, there's now a line of curious travelers um, all kind of checking out what's going on. Eventually, I'm cleared to continue onto my gate and I continue. The point of this story is to provide a small but concrete example from my own daily lived experience of how larger systems, including norms, values, and assumptions, are encoded constantly and reproduced through the design of socio-technical systems, or in political theorist Langdon Winner's famous words, how artifacts have politics. In this case, cis normativity is enforced at multiple levels of my interaction with airport security systems. So we talked about how this scanning technology, uh, the data set, the risk assessment algorithm, the operator practices, the training data that they use to create the algorithm, the workers who are tasked with classify, classifying the body scans uh, that they would then use to determine um, you know, what's, what's considered risky on a male versus a female body, all of those things are based on the assumption that there's only two genders and that the gender presentation will conform with so-called biological sex. And anyone whose body doesn't fall within an acceptable range of deviance from a normative binary body type will be flagged as risky and subject to the heightened and disproportionate burden of harms, whether small or potentially much larger, of airport security systems and the violence of empire that they instantiate. Gender non-conforming people are thus disproportionately burdened by the design of millimeter wave scanning technology. 
and the way that it's used. It's biased against us. To use Oski's term, it's a misgendering machine. And a lot of cis people are unaware of this. Cisgender means that your gender identity and presentation conform with the sex you were assigned at birth. And a lot of cis people are unaware of how this operates because, you know, it doesn't affect their lives in the same type of way. And most trans and gender nonconforming people do know because it produces this type of lived experience. Of course, these systems aren't only biased against trans people. They're biased against black people who frequently experience invasive searches of their hair, as documented by ProPublica, and against Sikh men and Muslim women and anyone who wears head wraps, uh, as documented by um, sociologist Simone Brown in her brilliant book, Dark Matters. As Brown discusses, gender itself is racialized. Humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female only through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. Airport security is also systematically biased against many disabled people uh, who are likely to be flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or if they use prostheses. And anyone who's simultaneously gender nonconforming, uh, black or indigenous, disabled, Muslim, etc. Well, if you have multiple identities uh, that are marginalized by this system, then you're going to face the highest risks of harm from the system. You'll be doubly or triply or multiply burdened uh, by the way that it works. And so for me, my white skin and US citizen citizenship place me in a position of relative privilege, right? So I'm certainly going to be spared the most disruptive and harmful potential outcomes of this system. I'm not going to get um, you know, placed in a detention center. I won't be placed in deportation proceedings. And I'm not going to have a hood placed over my head and be whisked away to a secret prison that forms part, one of the many secret prisons that form part of the global infrastructure of the continued so-called war on terror. I probably won't even miss my flight. I'll just be briefly detained and embarrassed uh, and maybe humiliated uh, through what security expert Bruce Schneier describes as security theater. So other people face much greater potential harms. Now, just in case, you know, I, sometimes I do this talk at, you know, engineering schools and universities, and I always get the one engineer, you know, who says, well, can't we just improve the system and make it so that it's not, you know, doesn't have the gender binary button? And in fact, that has now happened. So the scanning systems have been redesigned, and at some airports now, they have eliminated the binary gender uh, button. But I really want to make it clear that I'm not just talking about one particular technology. I'm using it as an example, um, which opens out into a larger conversation. And so we have to understand how this socio-technical reproduction of cis normativity that we're looking at in the millimeter wave scanner has to be understood in the context of rapidly increasing political, legal, and mass-mediated disinformation attacks against LGBTQIA plus people and trans people in particular. Um, I'm showing a map behind me uh, by the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, they just recently declared a, quote, national state of emergency for LGBTQ plus Americans for the first time, following an unprecedented and dangerous spike in anti-trans legislative assaults sweeping state houses this year. This is a map of more than 75 uh, anti-LGBTQ plus bills uh, that have been signed into law and others that have been proposed. And this is all happening very, very quickly um, in the context of the United States. So a trigger warning for my next slide. It has a hand-drawn illustration of violence against indigenous people. This image is an illustration of Vasco Nunez de Balboa in 1513. He's having his dogs devour 40 Caracua third gender people in what today is known as Panama, because he saw them as men in women's clothing, and he thought that it was a sign of Satan. And I include this slide to emphasize that the violent erasure of trans and gender nonconforming people isn't something new. 
It isn't something that only depends on socio-technical systems, on technological mediation. It doesn't only depend on uh, disinformation campaigns on social media. It doesn't depend on airport scanners, right? It's rooted, it's not rooted in computing. It's been happening for hundreds of years under the ongoing project of settler colonialism. So cis normativity has been imposed and is still being imposed on indigenous peoples throughout the Americas and around the world through centuries of violence, both spectacular like this and every day. Nishnabeg theorist and writer Leanne Simpson, among many others, is one of those who's systematically recovering some of these histories and some of these stories. And I really recommend this book. I can't recommend it enough, as we have always done. So by grounding an analysis of cis-normative border security systems in an understanding of hundreds of years of settler colonial violence, I want to make it really clear that I'm not an advocate of a so-called technical solution to the problems of millimeter wave scanners. I'm not looking for them to be less biased or more inclusive, right? Or more fair and transparent. Inclusion or fixing the anomaly isn't going to get at the underlying historical and structural problems. Instead, and I'm showing an image of the cover of Undoing Border Imperialism by Harsha Walia, which is a child with a butterfly in their hand and a guard tower and barbed wire behind them in a poster style. So instead, I'm asking us to think about how to build a world where millimeter wave scanners don't exist, right? Where they, like other security theater and border technologies and carceral systems and the violence of empire have all been abolished. So like Harsha Walia, I'm interested in undoing border imperialism. I'm interested in decarceral design, decolonizing design, and design justice. So what is design justice? Well, it's a framework for analysis of how the design of socio-technical systems influences the distribution of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. How does design distribute benefits and burdens between various groups of people? And in particular, design justice focuses very explicitly on how design can reproduce and or challenge the matrix of domination, which is Patricia Hill Collins, who's a, a black feminist sociologist from the United States, who was the head of the American Sociological Association, um, her term, matrix of domination, which is the way she talks about the, the interlocking systems of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler colonialism, and other forms of structural inequality as interlocking systems of oppression. This is a pencil illustration of Patricia Collins side by side with the cover of her book, Black Feminist Thought. And so she introduced the term in her book, Black Feminist Thought. The matrix of domination is a conceptual model that we can use to help us think about how power and oppression, privilege and penalties, benefits and burdens are all systematically distributed across this plane shaped by these different axes of structural inequality. So think about that for a second. And design justice calls for our ongoing attention to the ways that design processes of all kinds, whatever they might be, right? So whether it's graphic design, interaction design, industrial or product design, service design, urban planning, and the design of cities and spaces, well, they all tend by default, by default, to reinforce the matrix of domination. They don't have to, but if we're not careful, that's what they do. Now, design justice doesn't mean that there's necessarily one best approach to a design process that can magically undo the matrix of domination. It just asks us to more intentionally choose whether we want our work to contribute to dismantling or reproducing inequalities. Now, design justice is not only a framework for analysis. It's also a growing community of practice. It's not a term that I created either. It came out of this, this community of practice. And this is a you know, growing group of people focusing on the equitable distribution of design's benefits and burdens, 
more meaningful participation in design decisions, and the recognition of community-based, indigenous, and diasporic design traditions, knowledges, and practices. And it, it is a growing community of people and organizations across the United States and around the world. And it includes not only professional designers, but there's a lot of, um, you know, there are developers and software engineers, there's technologists, there's also journalists and community organizers and activists and artists and all kinds of people. And it was uh, born at the Allied Media Conference uh, back in 2015, actually. It was the first workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. And it was led by Una Lee and Wesley Taylor. And it was inspired by the Allied Media Project's network principles, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition principles, and a number of other um, sort of precursors. And this is an image um, from uh, that workshop where the 10 Design Justice Network principles were generated. Uh, now I'm showing an image of three intersecting circles in a Venn diagram where the top circle says who was involved in the process, uh, one of the lower circles says who was harmed, and the other one says who benefited. And this diagram was a simple tool that was used at the Generating Principles for Design Justice workshop to analyze several design for social good competitions that had taken place the previous year in the city of Detroit. Um, I don't have time to really you know, get into them, but it was looking at you know, what was very popular at the time, this is 2015, 2016, a lot of people doing these you know, design for good competitions and frameworks, and one of them was around um, you know, designing clothing for homeless people that could be multi-purpose, and the winner was a coat that could convert into a sleeping bag and a tent, and it got a lot of attention, and people were very excited about this. And so, in this workshop, we kind of looked at that project and several other projects uh, in the same genre, and we kind of explored them, and we thought about, you know, so, you know, where did the funding come from? Who were the design shops involved in the process? What ended up actually happening afterwards? You know, turns out that what ended up happening afterwards was that they distributed a handful of these. The design company got a lot of press. Um, the designers, you know, it helped their careers. Um, did it help address challenges of people not having homes in the city of Detroit? No, it didn't address that. Um, did it marginally improve some people's lives? Well, maybe, maybe not. There wasn't any you know, follow-up really. So the point is not to just trash design for good projects. The point is just to question them and ask this, you know, this basic set of questions about what's really happening here. Who's benefiting most? Is anybody being harmed? Where were the coats produced? You know, it turns out that they were, um, they were, they claimed that they were being produced by a local shop, but it's not clear whether that's really what took place. So you kind of have to, you have to look under the hood of these ideas of design for good. So through this process of exploring these design for good projects and then asking the question, what principles might guide us towards types of design work that could really um, do more than a hand wavy version of social good, we generated the following design justice network principles. Now, there are 10 of these principles and I'm going to uh, share them one by one. And what I'd like us to do actually is as I share them, if you like a principle, I'd like you to read it out loud with me, okay? So we're gonna go to church, here we go. So principle one. We use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. And if you really like it, you can kind of like go woo at the end or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Principle two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Yeah? Three, we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Okay, we got some love for principle three. Yeah. So we know where good intentions can lead. Four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process 
rather than only as a point at the end of a process. Okay. We're halfway there. Five, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. Okay. Okay. But I know that some of you, some of you are like, what, wait a minute, I studied really hard to get my design degree. I am an expert. Well, guess what? Principle six is also for you. So we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience. And we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process, right? So there's many forms of expertise. And yes, your um, you know, particular design discipline is one of them. Principle seven, we share design knowledge and skills with our communities, right? Instead of just always acting as gatekeepers. Principle eight, we work towards sustainable, community-led, and community-controlled outcomes. Okay, that one, everyone, like people like to talk about participation in processes, they like to talk about community leadership, but what happens if the thing that you produce together actually ends up controlled by and fully in the hands of the community that you worked with? Nine, we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. And this is the last one, last but not least, right? This is probably the most important one. <laughs> Let's, so I, I want everybody to read this one, okay? <laughs> you in the back, I see you, I see you not reading. Okay, <laughs> here we go, 10. Before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional, indigenous, and local knowledge and practices. Okay, so I'm glad that you like them. <laughs> These principles resonate with a lot of people. Um, the Design Justice Network, which you can find more about it at designjustice.org, uh, since these principles were launched in 2016, has grown. It's been nurtured by many, many people. So now by 2023, we've got uh, three network coordinators, care pod facilitators, and we do care activities constantly, both online and in person. We have local nodes, which are organizing in 11 cities uh, across the US and around the world. And we just have a lot of stuff going on. So I encourage you to check it out. And I'm gonna stop there so we have time for conversation. Amazing. Yes, oh my God. I like lunged up here so that, that we would optimize the time that we have uh, 15 minutes to the end of the session now. I love these principles. I heard them yesterday or in the rehearsal and I, I really appreciate how for even for myself, my design work is very different, but I find that it, these help me understand when, why it works when it works and also gives me some clues of sometimes why it doesn't quite work the way I, I do. So I feel it's very practical. I want to ask you about the third, though. We prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Mm. I mean, obviously, it, since I'm looking at that from a designer's perspective, I'm like, but my intentions, like, shouldn't they account for something? <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, maybe an example can help with this one. So good intentions are important but they're not as important as the impact uh, you know, on the community that you claim to be designing for, right? That's the principle. So one example would be, think about the early history of curb cuts, right? So curb cuts is, you know, you take the sidewalk and you make a tiny ramp and it makes it more uh, accessible for anyone who's using wheels in any way, whether you're using a wheelchair user, uh, if you're a bicycle user, if you're rolling luggage, and so on and so forth. Babies so, and strollers. Babies and strollers. So when curb cuts are first organized, you know, there's this intention to say, oh, can we make urban space more accessible for wheelchair users? Turns out that on the one hand, there's a whole bunch of good outcomes that were not the original intent that help all these other types of, you know, wheeled mobility in urban space function. But there's also some unintended negative consequences where blind and visually impaired people who had been used to um, you know, using canes or just sensing um, you know, where the sidewalk ends and the street begins by the curb, 
that diminishes um, their ability to move around in urban space. So the next yeah. generation of curb cuts then get rebuilt with small bumps on them um, to make it uh, serve the dual function. So there can be negative unintended consequences and there can be positive unintended consequences of design processes. And that's one example. Yeah. Okay, I have a stupid question. The millimeter wave scanner, I always assumed, never thinking about this actively, that the whole point of it being able to see through would, for instance, help. I mean, obviously, like what you're saying makes sense, super eye-opening. But if I were, for instance, a Sikh man or I'm wearing a hijab, would, isn't the whole point that the machine can see through, through, through the clothes and they don't have to touch my hair? No, the whole point is to make people feel safer, even though it's just security theater. Okay, no, yes, that's security theater, of course, yes. But can the machine, but I, but sorry, can the machine do the thing? <laughs> can the machine do the thing? That is the best question I've ever heard. Yes. <laughs> the answer is no, the machine cannot do the thing. Damn it. <laughs> but I, I know what you're asking is, uh, isn't it supposed to be able to not force people to remove clothing or remove head wraps? Yeah. The problem is that when they're training the system to flag uh, you know, potential anomalies that could be something dangerous, they're training it on a certain set of images. Mm -hmm. So they, they scan a bunch of people, right? And then you build a database of scans of people. And then you have a bunch of other people um, then look at new scans and click which ones are dangerous and where they're dangerous and where they're not. And you train the system that way. But when it turns out when they first scanned a bunch of people, who did they scan? They scanned a bunch of people who all look the same and don't use, um, you know, head wraps or headgear and aren't trans or gender nonconforming and don't have prostheses. And, and so have the same kind of hair? Hmm? And have the same kind of hair? Well, don't have it wrapped up, um, yeah. you know, above their head. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So then it doesn't work. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> hey, we have like 11 minutes or 10 minutes, really. I had an, another example that I wanted you to show, but maybe should we just skip that and go to the audience? Yeah, let's skip it. Yeah. 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 Let's. We. I mean, there are examples. You can hear them later <laughs> uh, or find them. Find them online. You uh, can read them in the book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> great. Uh, we, you. But we wanted to do a thing that I really liked that you talked to me about. That you heard another speaker. Let's do you want to do, do the thing? Let's do the thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, explain the thing, Sasha. Okay, we're going to do a thing. Um, so we're going to open this up to uh, Q&A, but to avoid that thing where like the one first question, you know, takes up five minutes of the time, um, we're going to do a thing where we're going to ask you to turn to somebody near you and you have 30 seconds to share with your neighbor a question that you have or a comment that you want to make. And 30 seconds for one person, 30 seconds for the next, and then we're going to open up uh, to the floor. And we find that that helps us get, you know, Questions that are more like tweets, uh, I won't call it X. Um, Old and, tweets. Short and, tweets. And less, less like dissertations. So, um, uh, Yeah, let's have some house lights if we can. And then uh, please turn to somebody and think, what would you like to ask if you get the mic uh, in a little while? Go. seconds you could switch switch please okay Snap once if you can hear me. Snap two times. Snap three times. Snap four times. Snap five times. Great. Yes. Who's got a question? Who's got a question? Did you all answer each other's questions? There's I can't one over see. There. Uh, uh, there's a question oh, there. There. Yes. Wave. Large wave. There we go. Yes. 
Hi, thank you for such an excellent presentation this morning. Um, first, my name is Emma. And I guess my question is more on the practical side. You know, I, uh, we talked about today being more practical. So <laughs> how do you recommend bringing these kinds of principles into an existing design organization that might be you know, really dominated by one homogenous perspective? already like what is what does that look like for you or do you have any recommendations can you do the example in like one minute yeah sure let's, let's do, do the, the example. example thank you that was an excellent question <laughs> great question okay so i love this example of the make the breast pump not suck hackathon and policy summit um, so this was uh, an initiative that came out uh, initially, of a number of students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I was a faculty member there, and um, some of them were my students at the Center for Civic Media. Um, they started off using sort of the MIT tradition of doing hackathons, and they started by focusing on um, breast pumps, and they had a really wonderful um, sorry, they had a really wonderful hackathon. They got a lot of people involved. Um, they produced a number of devices and device innovation. But through that process, they also learned a lot about how, well, you know, it's not only devices, it's also about sort of like access to spaces where you might be able to pump. And it's also about policy and family leave, which we don't have much of in the United States, um, and so on and so forth. So they got a lot of pushback from community organizers saying it's not just about these devices. So for the next edition, they organized the Make Family Leave not suck uh, policy summit. Mm -hmm. And so then they had, you know, community organizers and activists who were working on shifting, um, you know, policies that could increase access um, to um, not only to breastfeeding, but in more broadly. And then the next year, there was this question about like, well, this was cool, but it still happened at MIT in this sort of tech centric space. And it got a lot of press, but who was really prioritized? So the next year, they moved it to Detroit and they worked with a number of Detroit based um, black uh, maternal uh, care organizations like Harambee Care Col Collective and some others. And they created the Detroit Birth and Breastfeeding Hackathon. So they progressively moved it from device innovation to policy and then moved it out of the privileged institutional space of MIT into more and more community control. And so, of course, it's not, it's, it's, it's not that that was perfect, but it was an example of trying to use these principles and put them into practice um, to make ever more inclusive and community controlled uh, processes. And that it's allowed to be a process. It's one of the things that I love. And, that, and that the third thing was still a hackathon. Like, it's not like the tools are fine. Like, let's just use them with the right people in the right places. Like, that seemed... Very cool to me. Yes, more another question, please. Do we have another question? Do we have another question? Over here. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Lydia. I'm Hi. also from the United States, and thank you really for your beautiful perspective on the privilege that a lot of us see but don't actually understand. How do we get? So the United States government, which is probably the largest designer of things that, you know, not just US government, but the big governments are the largest designers of what we all feel on a day to day basis, I feel like. How do we get from, how do we get your work into those huge normative spaces? Um, it seems like you have purposely done this by working at MIT and Harvard, so you've given yourself the credentials that allow you to have a voice in places like that. Um, but a lot of people in these large institutions tend not to listen to people who are by definition counterculture. Mm. So how do we bridge that gap? It's mm. a great question. I feel like um, I feel like it's important to try and move work that's informed by principles like these, no matter what type of space you're in. And so I think that they are very powerful and flexible in that way. So you can use these principles in uh, you know, a community center or a social movement organization or a smaller collective. You can use them in a municipal government or you could potentially use them at the level of you know, a national government as well. And certainly there are people from inside um, different departments in different governments in 
the U.S. and around the world who have reached out to the Design Justice Network um, to ask us to do workshops, to do trainings, to do that type of activity. Um, I think people, you know, there are, there are institutions and there are people, and their institutions are composed of people um, and processes and technologies and other things. But there are people inside all types of institutions that are inspired by and interested in doing this type of work and moving it forward. And so I think the best thing that anyone of us can do is to think about, you know, what what might we be able to do, whatever institution we're operating within um, or against, um, to shift things. And there are s tiny steps that I think can be useful, um, and there can be entire phases of institutional transformation that are certainly necessary but won't be easy. And I loved the you know the keynote yesterday and the conversation around you know hospicing the 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 death and the end of organizations and institutions that we may not need anymore so that we can make way for um, new ones that are actually more deeply uh, informed, not only informed by, but deeply ingrained with um, principles like these and others that are emerging. Can I add to that? I think that that answer could all, like you could also approach the problem as a design problem. And then I would think about like, okay, which voices do have the ear of this? So I would, or, or in my experience, public sector organizations, governmental organizations like to, to, to tr take trips, for instance, to study successful case studies in other places. Mm -hmm. So let's say that the city of Malmö makes a very, I know there are people here from the city of Malmö, that's why you make like a really uh, successful project that ha works with these principles and these kinds of design designers. And then you build into that project communicating it mm. so that other government organizations on different levels can be inspired by it and will will hear about it. That's something that we can intentionally do in advance. As yes, well. this is the yeah. real answer. The city of Malmo should do an evaluation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, uh, we, a lot of thoughts are happening, uh, I, but I think that we, we should actually move to break. You will be in the pop-up li pop library signing uh, and taking questions. Uh, and of course, you can be found online, I assume, as well. Uh, so I think uh, that we will say here, thank you so much, Sasha Kostanzachak. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.